Hello, my name is Kevin Anikowski, and this episode is on teaching. The most basic type is expository instruction, analogous to didactic methods. They consist of an expert relaying information through any type of means, such as lecture, videos, instructions, with students who are, this is key, predominantly passive. Expository instruction and didactic methods are teacher-centered. Students are just information receptors. These methods tend to use advanced organizers as teaching tools. An advanced organizer is just a tool to show a connection, like a Venn diagram or analogies. For example, this analogy, jail is to imprisonment as the church is to... Uh, never mind. Next, non-directive teaching is more so student-centered. The teacher acts as a guide to facilitate learning the greater picture for a long-term goal in life, not short-term knowledge nuggets. Non-directive teaching may use the brilliant Socratic method in which the teacher probes via questions, articulated questions, so that the student determines the correct answer on their own or realizes the flaws in their logic. The Socratic method often uses symbolic modeling involving using the person's words or recording them to help them understand through their perception. Symbolic modeling is predominantly used in therapy. However, it is definitely applicable here. These straightforward teaching methods are basically the formal curricula, but they are distinct from the hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum is the rules and facts that people learn about the world without direct instruction, such as other people's worldviews or that most politicians are corrupt. Next, although it's low yield, there is a model called the Renzulli Triad Model of Educating, which isn't new, but it's more prevalent today. The triad model uses student-specific teaching methods. So what kind of teaching is it? Well, non-directive. Exactly. The triad model involves three types of teaching, including individual exploration, group exploration, and small group exploration with real-life problems. So it's three ways to keep the child engaged, and certain aspects of this are actually used in medical school. There is also the Bruner's idea of the spiral curriculum, which states students can learn any simple or complex topic, but each time they revisit it throughout their life, the information becomes more and more complex. For example, in research, you start out thinking that we've learned copious amounts of information in the field, but when you start to learn more and more about the research, you realize that we really don't know that much, and even what we do know is still under debate. <laughs> So the triad model just uses ways to focus on the student, and the spiral curriculum is the idea that things get more complex over time. Teachers can influence the success of their students, however, and I think you guys know this. Two cognitive biases that are important here are dubbed the halo and devil effect, discovered by Thorndike, when his research revealed that officers who rated one aspect of their soldiers as positive was strongly, too strongly, correlated with positive ratings in other unrelated aspects. So one positive aspect influences your perception of the other, such as in the halo effect or negative way, the devil effect. More recent research has revealed that the halo effect extends to physical attractiveness called the physical attractiveness stereotype, where greater physically attractive people are believed to have better personality traits. When you really know they're just a... never mind. This likely influenced Rosenthal's experiments in the classroom where teachers were told of intellectual bloomers, but in reality, these students were chosen at random. And these intellectual bloomers ended up faring much better than the control counterparts. Rosenthal called this the Pygmalion effect, or teacher expectancy effect. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's it for this episode.